and I'm one of the I'm one of the professors here uh, at the Bush School and part of the Center for Nonprofits um, and Philanthropy. So we have some of our staff on here that will help us look for questions that you might have. And we've got uh, what we think is a really interesting topic and two fantastic speakers for you. So uh, just a quick shout out um, to some of our special guests today, though, because we have some people joining us from um, Dr. Hansen's university, some of her students. So if anybody's there, you raise your hand and uh, we can give them a, a special shout out. But glad that they could join us. And I'm seeing some of my former students from various places here, too. So we're always giving extra love to the former students that come back to us. Um, so today, why did, why did we want to talk about political influence? Oh my goodness, because of the world we're living in right now, right? Um, so we, at the center, we try and um, do work that is relevant to, to people in the field. And I felt that this was a, a relevant topic. But another way that we do that is through um, the, the work that we do in continuing ed and outreach. And if you don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quickly. Um, I'm just going to share a couple things to kind of help frame our conversation today, and then we're going to turn this over and listen to the experts. Um, as a facilitator, one of the most fun things to do is to find people that you think are, are smarter than you in the area and can really offer insight, and we've got a great, great team for you today. So I'm going to go ahead and... Hopefully you're just seeing one screen at this point. Are we in the slideshow? No, we're on your screen. <laughs> it's in no. the presenter view. Oh, presenter goodness. view. <laughs> that was a problem. One second. Now you got to jump around. Yeah, that shouldn't have happened automatically like that. I'm gonna <laughs> put Just establishing your faculty bona fides. There we go. Oh, my goodness. We've been doing this since 2020, and this is where we're at. I know, and it keeps popping up automatically. <laughs> I don't know why that's happening? I'm not. I'm not clicking it at all. Okay, there's more than one way to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had this. this the, you mentioned they can put their their questions in the chat box if they want to. Alyssa will be more managing that as well. So I don't know if folks heard that. I can't remember whether you said that or not, Angela. But that's a way to get uh, folks. Also, if anybody wants to introduce themselves, the chat's another nice place to be able to do that so folks can see who's here. Thank you. I appreciate that because this is not good. <laughs> I haven't had this issue. Not cooperating. I know, and I haven't. Let's see. Try and move this around. Angela, I sent a chat about how to swap it once you're sharing your screen. Uh, it is not allowing me to do that. That's the challenge. So can we perhaps enlarge and make it work so we can get started? Yeah, there you go. That's more of what I would, would think. We can do it. And I say all the time that I've done this, I haven't had this issue. So sorry. Are you seeing one screen, one slide? Yes. Yep. Not ideal, but we see the one slide. Sorry, guys. Um, so part of what we do at the center is reach out and with our work and try and help prepare leaders for the future. So we do this in a couple of different ways. You know, we work through research uh, and trying to provide information that's useful. Uh, we have the professional outreach and engaged learning that really comes into two different buckets, which is continuing ed and capacity building. So something like today, we think covers a lot of these areas because we're bringing research to you, but we also hope to leave you with some tips about how you can manage um, donors better within your organization. So today, when we talk about politics, you know, this is a really unique situation. We know that uh, we've had some changes and one of our speakers is going to be able to speak to that, uh, how it's affecting her day to day work in political fundraising. But for our research is based in this idea of social identity. 
And so just to frame our conversations, think about the idea that, that donors really identify with different social identities. We create these. Um, Dr. Tim Seiler uh, gave, gives us an example. He does sort of a wheel in achieving fundraising excellence and talking about the different roles and responsibilities we have in our lives and, and how those might change over time. And that context is going to change how donors might react to your organization or or what, in, you know, what cause they're trying to support at the time. I like to look at it as more of this this universe and these bubbles on the right, because sometimes there are days when certain pieces of this are going to be you know, larger than others, or things may move around. It may move closer to self um, and further away from self. If you've got little kids, that family bubble at the bottom is going to be larger and probably a little closer. So I think these it's important for us as fundraisers and nonprofit executives to understand that these move around and that, that donors truly do have mixed motives. OK, and that was hard for me when I started studying philanthropy and fundraising, because I really had hoped that people were just giving because it was the right thing to do. But the reality is, is we're all a lot more complex than that. And so you know, we have to be able to understand that donors might behave differently based on what's happening externally. Might be something that's happening internally with their family. Uh, might be the relationship they have to your organization or what's going on within your local ecosystem, like your local community, why would your organization happen to be more relevant at one point or another, right? So we have to be willing to know that they sort of fluctuate in, in their connection to our organization. And that's part of what we do as fundraisers to help them stay connected to us. Um, but that's that sort of has to be the premise for us to really understand how we work with our donors. And in, the, in a political environment, particularly, um, we can think about whether or not we tend to identify as more liberal or conservative. You notice there aren't any political parties. I didn't use you know, red, white, and blue, because that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about party affiliation, but just generally how you lean and toward sort of your lens to the world. And so how does that relate to us as fundraisers? Because we're not necessarily sitting down saying, oh, this I'm visiting with you know Will Brown and I'm going to go on a visit and I think he leans in this direction. I mean, we don't normally start there. We instead we think about, oh, this is what Will Brown does as a job. This is where he lives. This is his family life and, and universe. Those are all social identities. Politically, we tend to, at least in my experience, we don't necessarily think about political leanings, unless we are in sort of a politically charged environment or, you know, national elections, something that's heightened. Um, we So we have a heightened reason to really share those, you know, tendencies. And so one way that we can think about this as a fundraiser is we always say, and those of you that have either had me in class or heard these talks before, we never vary from the mission, right? Our mission doesn't change, but how we might talk to people about our mission could change. So for example, as we were preparing for our talk today, we used the example of the environment. If, if we were promoting an environmental nonprofit, you know, we might talk about environmental protection and keeping a green community for, for younger, you know, for our children or grandchildren with certain folks, but others, we might talk about environmental preservation. And it, depending on what is we think is more appealing to them. So luckily we have Dr. Hansen with us today. She's done uh, a lot of research in this space and she's um, been able specifically to study uh, how people react and how their motivations shift based on whether they have liberal or conservative tendencies. And I'm excited for you to hear that. Um, when I first heard about her research, uh, last spring, I immediately thought we need to have this this talk in the fall. So the other part of what we're talking about today is going to be political fundraising and understanding that that is different than the traditional professional fundraising that you learn at AFP or in any fundraising classes that we have. Uh, some of the things that make that different is that you know we do have you know tighter regulations around it that restricts fundraising. Um, there, it can be more transactional than what we hope to have in the traditional philanthropic setting. Another thing is that um, we're not as, when I talk about transactional, I'm thinking more about you know, like maintaining or losing control. Um, and specifically the House or Senate is an example I've given you here. That's not necessarily what our, our donors are thinking when we're in the midst of a capital campaign, or you're asking somebody to chair your annual fund. There's a, there's a different outcome that they're looking for. And it, it's going to, help us talk to them differently and help us develop different strategies. 
Um, having contingency plans, um, for example, is something that's not as uh, as prominent in our traditional fundraising. If we're having a capital campaign, we don't necessarily say, well, if they don't raise the money for that building, I'm going to go give the money to the competing school across town. Uh, it, it's a different mindset. And I think it's really helpful when for us to understand that as we're working with donors, either individuals or cor corporations, when they're in this heightened environment where politicals, um, the, you know, the political um, conversations are more at the forefront of, of our just common dialogue. So another thing to remember when we're talking about political fundraising is that those major donors could be individuals or corporations. And so I'm going to let um, our guest Mary speak about that. So with, with that, I hope that's enough framing for you to understand where we're headed today. And I'd love to introduce our speakers. So Dr. Ruth Hansen, I have to give her a shout out because she's she and I went to the same through the same program, but we didn't meet each other until much later. So it's one of those, I think it's kind of a, a special prize at the end, right? That we've we found somebody that has the same research interest, even though we weren't there at the same time. Uh, she is an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin. Whitewater's College of Business and Economics. So if you've been with us long enough, we're in a school of government and, and public service. These also, these centers are housed in all different parts of the university and hers happens to be business. Uh, she is director of their Institute for Nonprofit Management, but teaches classes in nonprofit uh, organization, fundraising, um, certainly organizational behavior, but she loves to research where I like to be out in the field a little more. So I really respect that and, and enjoy reading her work. Um, she tries to connect theory and practice, though, because she does have 20 years of experience as a professional fundraiser. So she's bringing those super relevant questions to, to her research, and, and we love to see that. And we think that's really helpful for you. I've given you a, a couple topics here of her recent research. Uh, she's been exploring how social values determine um, unmet needs. Impulse giving, she's got a great article about whether those little like last minute decisions at the grocery store, do you want to round up or do you want to help this organization? That's come out. Uh, and also some ways to reframe fundraising. So she's an emerging scholar through AFP and I'm also happy to say that uh, we've supported her uh, research by funding her through the AFP Foundation. So that gives you a little background about her work and what she brings to it. And our second speaker is Mary Ridenour. We're so thrilled to have an alumnus back with us. Uh, Mary graduated from the Bush School in 2023, and she very quickly after graduation joined the morning group. And she's, she started in stewardship, and she's moved through that and with our association of former students at Texas A&M. So stewardship, she started thanking people, right? Then moved forward interning with the, the Heritage Foundation, but then moved over onto the development operations team. And I remember having conversations with her about how much she learned about the operations and the database and all the back end and of how important that can be. And um, she did study um, with us uh, for a couple of years. I had her in class, so I'm also thrilled to hear her perspective on fundraising, but she's in the midst of all of this political fundraising right now. Um, you can see her, she has a background in international studies, which I'm eager to see how that plays into the work that she does as a, a, at a political fundraising firm today. So with that, I would love to turn this over to Dr. Hansen. I'm going to stop sharing this, this mini screen, and we're just going to have a conversation uh, with the, the two of them, and then we're going to give you an opportunity to ask questions. Well, thank you for that for that gracious welcome, and thank you so much for for um, you know uh, conceiving of this idea and uh, hosting us and and inviting me to come share our work. Um, I do want to give a, a, a shout out in that uh, the research that, that I'm primarily talking about today was um, was in fact funded by the AFP Foundation for Philanthropy. So if we have any AFP members on the call right now, if you have maybe uh, given to support research or considered that, um, this is this is something that has directly come from uh, from a grant from that. So we really appreciate that. Also, this research uh, was done with my good friend and colleague, Lauren Dula, who's at SUNY Binghamton. Um, and so just want to just want to say that, yes, this is a collaborative project in many different ways. So I love, <laughs> excuse me, I'm so sorry, I'm getting over a cough. 
Um, I love that you brought in Tim Seiler's work on social identities. And social identities is one of those things that that we we just kind of bandy about um in 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 well in the normal conversations I have anyway. Um but just to just kind of ground in what that is, um the scholars who really started this field of study define it as mental constructs by which individuals identify as members of groups. And we may or may not be actively thinking, okay, I am going to choir practice. Right now, I am seeing things through a choir lens, right? But when we get back to, you know, Angela, you started by saying, I want to believe that people just gave because it was the right thing to do. How you judge was the right thing to do is partly given by the situation you're in, right? And partly by what role you're playing in that situation. So if I was to say, telling the truth is a good thing, hopefully many of us would would say, yeah, yeah, telling the truth is a good thing. And if you're saying in a business meeting, then you might be, yes, we need to tell the truth on this. Or you might be like, mm, they don't want to hear it. If you are perhaps at home with young children, we might teach them to tell the truth and at the same time tell them about the tooth fairy, right? And 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 that strictly speaking, you know. So so you put on different hats that that offer these lenses. And <coughs> excuse me, I'm so sorry. And one of the and and, and we use social identities in our fundraising practice, right? We often do what's called like activating social identities. If you work for a university, which I did for 12 years, you're likely to refer to people as alumni, right? You want you want to spark that tie, right? So you you might encourage identification with the beneficiaries of the organization. Again, going back to the universities, uh, if it's for student scholarships. You're going to maybe include stories about when people were students to kind of get them to make that connection. It might be identification with other donors, um, people like you, right? I just got my Wisconsin Public Radio t-shirt that says, you know, support for Wisconsin Public Radio uh, is, is given by people like me, for example. Um, or it might be identification. Russell James at Texas Tech has done a lot of work about this idea of a donor hero role, right? Or, or uh, perhaps other moral identities, people who are kind, people who are generous, right? So you might activate these different identities. And then we often try and encourage identification with a group because there's been study after study that shows that when we perceive an in-group, that's who we're more likely to support, people like us in general. <clears throat> or, but like us can be sliced and sliced in different ways. And that's where these social identities come in. We have some, some freedom in how we define these groups. So what Lauren and I decided to do was look at political ideologies. And you can certainly define political ideologies in a couple of different ways. It could be your support for policy positions, which is, which is more of like an intellectual type of way, a cognitive type of way of approaching it. But it could also be, do you personally identify as more conservative? Do you personally identify as more liberal? And as Angela said earlier, you know, often there's a correlation with what party you're supporting or voting for, but not necessarily. And, and so we wanted to ask people, how do you see yourself as more conservative, as more liberal? And then we brought into it um, a, a tool to examine their their motives for giving. And this is based on a, a scale. We didn't, excuse me, use it exactly 
uh, as as a scale, but we we brought in elements from the motivations to give scale, which brings in factors such as altruism, which is here. I, I, I know that people talk about altruism in lots of different ways. Here it means, are you thinking more about others? When you're making your decisions, is it because you're concerned about others? You're helping others. You feel compassion. Another group of possible motives is egoism. And again, I want to be real careful here because that doesn't necessarily mean selfish, but it does mean that you're thinking about how it affects you, such as you feel good when you give to charities, you feel needed, it, it you feel recognized when you give to charities, right? So motivations that are more focused on others versus how it makes me feel. Um, we also looked at some elements of trust, and we also looked at some social elements. And our thought was, you know, there's been a lot of research that looks at politics and charitable giving. Just because there's a lot of research doesn't mean that it all points in the same direction. But it tends to look at behavior. And some studies have found that conservatives give more. Some people, have, some studies have found that conservatives give less. Some have found that conservatives and liberals give about the same. And they're all set up slightly differently. We were like, okay, so there's all this stuff on behavior. We want to look at the motivations, which we think is something that people who are practicing as fundraisers for charities can work with a little bit more. Um, so we did a survey. We included questions about, do you consider yourself on a seven point scale, very conservative on one end to very liberal on the other. And then we asked them a number of questions, thinking about your choices of, of giving to charity, which of the following describes your attitudes with questions like, I give because I'm concerned about those less fortunate than myself. Giving to charities makes me feel powerful. My image of charitable organizations is positive. Others with whom I'm close value donating to charities. So we're trying to get at all these different um, aspects of, of do motivations differ along with your social identity as far as your political ideology, right? Okay. Um, excuse me, I am so sorry. Just to put it in a nutshell. So I'm, I'm curious. Um, I, and I, I know that we have the reactions button. I'm going to put you uh, down at the reactions button at the bottom there. If you think that political, that, um, that people's motivations for why they give to charity probably is the same across political ideologies as a social identity, probably does not relate at all. Press that reaction button and raise your hand. Okay. And if you think that, yes, it, there probably is some different that correlates with that social identity, press that reaction button and raise your hand. Yeah. Well, our findings totally bear that out. And if they didn't, probably Dr. Seaworth wouldn't have invited me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, there is. And this makes sense, right? Because if you if you tend to see yourself as, you know, political ideologies as as a social identity tends to be tied to different um frames of reference, different, different um, different ideas of what is the right thing to do, even though there can be a great deal of overlap in terms of what outcomes there are, we might see the world a little bit differently in ways that are tied to those social identities. In general, what we found from this snapshot, and this is this is very surface, we're working on, on getting a more detailed version out right now, if the respondent tended to be more liberal, 
they reported that those other regarding motives mattered more to them. People should be willing to help those who are less fortunate. I feel compassion toward people in need, and that is what motivates me to give to charity. We found that as people were more conservative, reported being more conservative, again, as their self-reported social identity, the more the self-regarding motives mattered to them. I donate to charities because it makes me feel needed. I like being recognized for giving to charity. Both of these are resulting in gifts, right? Both of these are funding charities, um, but different approaches, different things motivating to them. Both people who responded as being very conservative and being very liberal were strongly motivated by trust issues, but very differently. People who said that they were very liberal tended to report that they had a very positive image of charitable organizations, and they found that to be a motivating factor. People who reported being very conservative felt that they were very concerned that the money given to charitable organizations might be wasted. So very concerned about um, the aspect of accountability. Interestingly, one of the main um, overall, if you look at people without considering, uh, you know, does this vary by this particular so social motivation, one of the aspects that's been found to really correlate with a strong motivation to give is social motivations. And that may very well be true for our sample, but we found that that did not vary. So that was equally true for conservatives and for liberals. That was something that did not break down. So I'm going to pause there um, because I know we have some other topics to get into, um, but that is that is uh, a snapshot, the kind of work that uh, Dr. Dula and I are working on right now. And, um, it feeds into some practical pointers that we'll get to later. Great, thank you so much, Ruth. Mary, how about you sort of enlighten us of, about what it's like to work in today's environment in a political fundraising firm? Yes, um, so I my role in political fundraising is national major donor fundraising. Um, I, I'll give you a little crash course on political fundraising because when I started, I knew almost nothing about it. Um, so I I serve as a consultant and I primarily work um, directly with House and Senate um, current members and candidates who are um, seeking election for the first time. And um, so as Dr. Seaworth mentioned, there are regulations regarding how much money you may donate directly to a campaign. And then there are entities outside of the campaign that help support uh, candidates' elections like PACs, super PACs, um, joint fundraising committees, and all of those have lots of different regulations um, coming down from the Federal Election Commission. Um, and in my role, um, we, it's, it's been a tumultuous year. Um, this cycle has seen a lot of political changes that have never happened before. Um, I, four months after I started in this role, um, the speaker of the house was ousted and donor motivation just plummeted. Um, there was a there became a, a lack of trust between donors and the um, members and leadership that they were choosing to support. Um, and I think one of the things that we started seeing is that the races that were becoming the most contentious, what what the um, national Republican, um, congressional committee and what the Democratic Republic or Democratic 
congressional committee were naming as their top races were the things that donors were suddenly the most interested in because they said dollar for dollar, this is where the most help is needed. Um, and it, it did become very much partisan motivated um, with a few exceptions always. Um, but I think one of the one of the big things um, that I think is applicable in the political fundraising world as well as nonprofit fundraising is that um, people's political beliefs are on a spectrum and um, everyone is, you know, they they have an identity, but they can vary vastly issue by issue. And um, my role as a fundraiser is helping connect donors with candidates that fit wherever they are on the political spectrum, which I think is very much, again, um, something that is very applicable to nonprofits as well, because your, your organization and your issue may fall in very different places for people on their, on what they consider to be their political motivated spectrum. Um, and by focusing on what you have to offer um, as an organization, you know, you can you can target people at, at different places because everybody's kind of all over the board. Um, I think trust in leadership is, is has been a, a big thing this cycle. Um, after the the speaker and then um, the change in the top of the ticket, um, donors they they sort of transitioned their focus to what we call the down ballot which is okay the you know the top of the ticket the presidential race um looks kind of crazy and there is a lot of you know media attention to this and and um that's where um the contingency plan kind of came in it's like okay so we can't we can't necessarily control what's happening um, at the highest level, but we can focus on helping um, state and local government. We can focus on our, um, you know, local house candidate. How can we help them? Um, what can we do about the Senate? You know, and it was like let's let's take a bottom up approach instead of a top down approach because the top top stuff is all over the place. So who can we help um, at the lowest level? that will also, um, you know, be more representative of us. And so it, it it's just, it, it changes a lot. And I think Washington DC is a very, um, it's a, it's a, it's very transient in, in nature. Um, which was just a very different world from when I started in nonprofits. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, with that, I want to offer just sort of our summary of some words of wisdom as you prepare some questions for us, because what we had talked about as a group, we thought some nice takeaways from this might be, and it seems so perfectly timed, Mary, with how you wrapped up, is that the political world is fickle, right? And things can, things are going to be changing in D.C. all the time, especially if we're talking at that level. But guess what? As I'm out doing rural philanthropy work, I find state and local government can be rather fickle, too. You know, things are changing. So one of the advantages nonprofits have is we don't have to respond to what's happening at the national level, right? What we have to do is focus on our own missions, promote our own missions, because that shouldn't change, regardless of what party's in office, regardless of who the new judge is locally, you know, we still have our mission. Now, do we want to build relationships with those new people? Absolutely. But our our mission shouldn't shift based on local politics or, or politics at any level. Um, one of the things we discussed was that it, it's a mistake to assume that all donors to an organization share the same beliefs. And that has been one of the most interesting learnings that I've had just doing the fundraising work for over 20 years is knowing that you can talk with two donors and, and leave, you know, we have a coffee with one and a lunch with someone on the same day. They sit together at board meetings or at events. You think they're very similar. And when you get in one-on-one, -on -one, they have completely different reasons for supporting the organization. And you actually, sometimes you leave wondering how they're even friends. 
So people can be so different, especially with um, political issues. You know, they, they may not bring that to the table as part of their professional self. So don't make the assumption that we all believe the same thing. Also, don't make the assumption that the staff and the donors believe the same thing, because that's also not the case. Those of you that are run have large staffs in your nonprofit, there's no way we're all agreeing on things. So keep that in mind. A uh, couple other points is that uh, to note is that policy can affect accessibility, right? But it doesn't determine what our need is. So, you know, this is something that we have to continue showing the relevancy of the work of our organization, but we don't have to jump into advocacy at this point and try, you know, if if it's a politically charged issue we're dealing with, if it's maybe a fringe issue for us, this isn't maybe the best time um, during an election cycle to jump into advocacy. But instead, perhaps in the current climate, we might support people who are already doing the advocacy work on behalf of, of our issue. If that makes sense. I saw see a few people nodding. <laughs> um, the other thing is donors are becoming disenchanted. And that's particularly because of the unrest we see. But I think that in the last couple of years, we've had some negativity about philanthropy and you know, like donors are, are leaving in droves and things. And we know that that's not true. We see a, a drop in donors, but it's really more of a correction um, to pre-COVID numbers. Uh, we certainly want to work on stewardship. It's a great time to reach out to people, to thank them and to communicate with them but not necessarily the, the time to try and go in and, and leverage, you know, some sort of new approach based on, on like their political leaning between now and November. Um, and the last thing is just listen to your donors, you know, listen to them and stay focused on your mission. And we think those are some of the key takeaways, but I um, would love to, you know, just open up to some of your questions now. Hopefully some of that might have addressed a few of them, but while we have Mary and, and Dr. Hansen here with us, what, what questions do you have? So, um, Mary, um, could you tell us a little bit maybe about how you work differently with like sharing the message with people in maybe different parts of the country and how how that might impact what what we're doing with donors? Yeah. Um, so I think one one very poignant example um, that we find a lot. Um, so I I primarily work. Uh, with Republicans. Um, that's what my firm handles. And um, in states, for example, like California, where they um, have a lower number of state representatives that are part of the Republican Party, um, we find that they are very motivated to meet with out-of-state members um, who are doing work on issues that they find are really important. Um, so one of the things that um, was very interesting to me when I started working on political fundraising rather than nonprofit fundraising is that um, there is an appetite for um, donors on a national level to meet with and support um, members and candidates that you know, represent a district all the way across the country from them, um, oftentimes because of certain um, social issues or um, thing, you know, like policy work that they do or the committees that they sit on. Um, you know, for example, um, we have a donor that is very, very interested in environmental issues. That is his passion project. Um, and he will meet with anyone from all over the country if they're working on environmental issues or if they sit on an environmental committee. Um, and so kind of in that realm, we find that um, in in different areas of, of the country, there are different policy issues and social issues that are most um, pressing for them. 
and they are looking for candidates and members who will help support that and back that up. Um, I think. Great. Sorry, I thought you were oh, done when you paused. No, I think the last thing I was going to say is I think the one um, exception to that is, um, you know, what we call these quote unquote top races where there are opportunities, um, you know, like for that party to pick up a new seat or to flip a seat. And um, those those races seem to across the board, regardless of location or um even where they're at on the on the political spectrum, um, we see a lot of people uh, seem to be really focused on, you know, partisanship in that case. Okay. A little bit of an well, example. Thank you. We have two questions. And um, one, uh, we'll just take them in the order they came in, but they're asking... Uh, and curious to know how you handle someone who voices their liberal or conservative belief and you don't agree with it and you're afraid to answer because you don't want to lose or alienate the donor. Do we have a quick response for that? Yeah, this is this is something that I personally experienced as a fundraiser and I've also spoken um, with other fundraisers uh, on this topic. And generally the most common answer I hear is stick to the stick to what you have in common, which is the support for the organization. So there's a couple of different ways it could come up, right? The person could be voicing a belief that is that they're they're assuming that you probably share it because you share and value what this organization is doing. But the belief they're they're focusing on is not really relevant to what the organization does. I'm sure everybody on the call probably has the skills to just kind of demure and and shift it back to focusing on what the organization does. That can certainly be very. Um, it, it causes stress, right? It causes stress because we would like to we would like to think that, hey, we're working in the same direction. Um, the most honest response I can think of in this situation is you both value what your organization is doing and focus on building that bridge. That's a great segue in a sense to the next question. And maybe we tie the, if yeah. you have other comments into it, because the second question as one of our uh, participants with us today works in gun violence prevention yeah. and the organization is nonpartisan. And so they assume their donors hold a range of different beliefs about guns, but that they all share the same central belief right. about gun violence. So sort of what you were just saying is try and like, let's come together around the issue we all support. So they, they'd like to know, is this a reasonable assumption and how can, you know, we navigate such a charged topic like gun violence as an example, um, without, if, if, without knowing we're aligned with the, the donor's expectations. Yeah. And, and if I may respond to that again, this is informed by conversations that I've had with other, um, uh, fundraisers who I really respect, um, Occasionally, there will be a, a donor who you are talking with who may advocate for a position that is not the position of the organization. Like overall, you know, there's there's the there's the issue of gun violence, but perhaps it's a difference in how should we treat people, how should we treat policy. Um, uh, and of course, you know, should guns be banned outright or should this be a matter of education and safety or regulation or what have you, right? And and the best uh, to, to me that I have heard in terms of negotiating this is if you hear somebody is is that, you know, social identities as, as you form relationships with your donors, there will tend to be more alignment on the issues that are really core to why you guys are together on this issue. But that doesn't happen overnight and you don't want to exclude people 
who think that they support something that you do, but it's not like a 100% match, right? You all focus on, well, what, where, where do we have shared goals and values? I spoke with one fundraiser who found himself in a room with somebody who was uh, advocating for a position and assuming that the organization shared this belief, right? That was, um, that was not at all what the organization shared. And um, and he described it as, you know, you want to think in terms of long-term education. You want to be honest about this is not the position that our organization has chosen. Or, and, and this is why our organization supports this other position. And it's that balancing act between you want to listen to where your donors are because they're still going to be there, whether or not you know it, right? Better to listen and hear, but it's it's okay to be true to the position that your organization takes, and hopefully you are un, you know you you've gone into understanding what's the thought process behind this and stuff. Uh, there's definitely delegate negotiation that can go on there, but again, just focus on. What are the aspects that you probably agree on trying to promote? And if it turns out that there really isn't agreement there, honestly, that's okay. Honestly, that's okay. So it's, it goes back to when we teach about major gifts and that sometimes it's okay to say no to a, to a gift if that donor can't align with your mission or if there's some sort of ethical or conflict of interest between it. So we have a bunch of questions. This is so cool. They took a while to start typing them, but we have a lot to get through. I love that. Um, a quick one, Mary, could you ha help us understand? They want to know, do donors want to be asked for donations from the candidate? And so they imagine the answer is yes, but it'd be really difficult to accommodate people's requests. So how do you handle that? Um, actually, so primarily, yes. The, the first... Ideally, the first ask always comes from the candidate. Um, not all of our candidates are, um, they're all on varying degrees of their um, fundraising ability. Some of them are not so great at making the ask. Um, some of them are incredible at it. And so uh, my role as a consultant for them is, um, primarily to help put them in touch with these donors, help connect them with the people who are going to be most interested in their campaign and, and what they're seeking to do in, in Congress, and then to help them through the process of making the ask. And um, sometimes that does mean that the ask comes from me, but ideally in a perfect world, the ask should always come first from the candidate because it do, donors do prefer that. I mean, it, it is just much, it's much more impactful when it comes directly from them. Thank you. We have another question um, about whether the level of individual motivation um, versus large donor motivation during the election period is affected equally or differently. So I'm assuming that that, that person's meaning more of the an average donor versus major donor. Um, so I, I think I actually find that, um, our major donors have a support system in place, um, in the form of typically a political advisor or a, you know, maybe a government relations person that is part of their company, um, that helps, keep up with the the influx and and um the lower dollar donors oftentimes don't necessarily have those and and the lower dollar donors um what what I what I have seen primarily is that um those folks get very overwhelmed and inundated and the the donor burnout on the lower dollar folks is much much higher um compared to our our major donors usually have a level of separation between, you know, their text messages, inbox, uh, meeting calendar schedule compared to um, that of, you know, someone who doesn't have that political gatekeeper. Thank you. 
Okay, here's one that's interesting if anybody's been on social media lately. Um, we're wondering if there's been a study on the effectiveness of political advertisements on social media uh, for fundraising, and specifically in the presidential election. Uh, wondering what strategies are most effective to get individuals to donate. And they give the example for um, recently, uh, they've seen a lot from President Obama, VP Harris, and Tim Walz fundraising for the Harris Walz campaign. And I was just curious about their fundraising strategy. Either of you like to take a stab at that? I can't speak on the research portion, but I can speak on the fun the strategy part. Um, at, there are several levels of fundraising strategy for major national campaigns. Um, there is there's digital fundraising, which includes, you know, text messages, emails, social media campaigns. Um, and that's where the lower dollar donations come from. Um, you know, some people will give quite literally 10 cents a day um, through these campaigns. And um, sounds like a <laughs> sounds like it wouldn't amount to much, but there are a lot of people who will do it because they get a text message or they um, see a social media post. Um, the next level up is the national major donors because campaigns are restricted to $6,600. That's the largest gift you may give to an individual campaign. Um, that's what a major donor is considered. Um, the super PACs, you can give, you know, millions and millions of dollars to, and that's a kind of a different ball game, but, um, and I'm, I'm, I am happy to talk about that because that's, you know, when you see ads on TV, that's usually where it's coming from is a super PAC, not the campaign. Um, but the, the, the next level up, um, you know, what we consider a major donor in, in the political world, they take a lot more of a, a much more personal touch, you know, like meetings, phone calls from the candidate, um, connections with the fundraising team personally. Um, so that 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 is a totally different kind of strategy compared to like the digital fundraising strategy, um, which is sort of just put it everywhere and hope people will pick it up. <laughs> Okay. Well, with that, we are coming to to an end. Ruth, do you have a, a minute comment on, on that last question from your work? No, to be honest, I, I, I don't really follow the research on political fundraising so much. So I completely defer to Mary's experience on that. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I was able, I think, to manage to get my screen to work. <laughs> and uh, hopefully you're all now actually just looking at one, one screen. Uh, this slide does have all the, the takeaways that I shared right before our comments. Okay. And then we wanted to also invite you back because we, we love having new faces and having our, our friends and an alum uh, join us as well. But this fall, our continuing professional education uh, certificates are launching. So there's still an opportunity for you to check that out if you're interested. And then we have other webinars. We do one, um, Dr. Taylor, Dr. Brown, and I do one every semester. So you can always count on that. Put us on your calendar to, to join us three times a three times a semester. And so we have the dates for you here. And then even um, Alyssa has been terrific to give you a, a, a QR code there so you can scan to join it. So uh, with that, love to just say thank you for joining us. Here's all of our information at the center. If there's anything we can do to be helpful to your organization uh, or you want to continue the conversation in some way, just let us know. And we've actually ended on time. How's that? <laughs> But thank you again to Ruth and Mary for taking time to do this. I know Ruth actually is teaching it class today. I know Mary's at work. So it's terrific to be able to bring in this expertise that we don't have here at the Bush School. And I think that we've got a lot going on. Um, you know, we've had the, the debate this week. There, there are things that we're seeing, um, given the fact there's a, a presidential election, we're seeing things differently than we would every, you know, just a, a local election. So hopefully this is going to be really helpful to you as you talk with your donors, uh, particularly around those charged issues. I'm glad that we had, you know, a question around that. 
Thank, Thank you so much. So we do appreciate it. Oh, Thank you. Time. Thanks for joining. Bye.